bear witness that there is no God but he and Muhammad is his servant. I just had to ask a question because I'm not able to tune in. I want to, uh, my dear brothers and sisters, continue where we, more or less where we left off from last time. I was privileged to be in your midst. And uh, I want you to, I hope that you will pay good attention to everything we're going to cover. Don't let your mind drift. You know, if you, uh, and I'm sure at least once in your life, you've been in, in a position where you have said something to someone in order for them to make a decision. Haven't you? At least once. How often have you been in a decision, in a position rather, where what you said to whoever it was you were talking to, depending upon how well you presented the material and depending upon how they reacted, determined their destiny. Listen. Every time a brother or sister gets up on this rostrum or this in this city or wherever we are throughout this country and represents the message that we bear witness that God revealed to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, if it's a 15-minute talk or a two-hour talk, that talk has to contain certain elements. Certain points must be there, irrespective of the circumstances that one finds oneself in or that the audience is in. Because after the talk is done, whether that day or some other day, the listener is compelled to make a decision whether he or she realizes that or not. That's one of the reasons, not the only, one of the reasons why we urge us to be on time. When we go to see a movie or an opera or a symphony or whatever, or something you want to see on television on a certain night, you want to see it from what? The beginning. Why? He said, I don't want to miss anything. If I was in Phoenix, last night I was someplace else but if I was in Phoenix last night I would probably well, in all probability watch the fights go ahead. <laughs> what part do I want to come come in on the beginning not the fifth or sixth round why I don't want to miss a blow that's right. you said that's savage brother <laughs> well we still got work to do on ourselves lateness will get us killed today but look, you say, well, people die every day. But look, suppose you, let me put on a, on a level that everybody can relate to. Suppose you were told that if you can just stay alive 10 days and lose 15 pounds, that there's $50,000 waiting for you. What would you do? You try to stay alive. You try to lose 15 pounds if you needed 15 pounds to lose. Everybody wants to be rewarded those who say they don't, you're a liar. A liar. Because that's, it takes your entire being to tell that lie. Everyone who says they don't want, do, do not want good for themselves, you're insane. Plus a liar. Make sense so far? Now, I'm going to begin this by the help of Almighty God with two magazine articles. One is Ring Magazine with Mike Tyson's picture on the cover. It's a photo of him. And here is another one, Life Magazine, but this is not a photo. It says, who was he? The small print says, solving the mystery of Jesus and why it matters today. He's pictured as what? A white man. This obviously is somebody we know he's a brother. What's the connection? Now, I'm not going to try to cover everything today. I'm just going to do what I can. And then there's one more time I hope to come, if it please Allah, to finish what I'm trying to say. Talking on the subject of Jesus and the truth of Jesus is the most difficult area of the entire body of information God revealed to Elijah Muhammad to give us. I've just been coming up to it the last two times I was here because there's somebody in the audience that's new. And we must reach that brother or that sister that's brand new to this. Some others of you may have been here umpteen years. You say, I already know the subject. Fine. You haven't exhausted all the knowledge there is in the subject. 
because the revealing of the truth of Jesus is the revealing of the person of God. The process by which Jesus became, they say, both Lord and Christ is the process by which God becomes God and maintains his godliness. So don't tell me that you've been around 30 or 40 years and you've exhausted the subject. Please, just say that you've lost interest. <laughs> okay. Now, those of us who are brand new, well, we have a lot of work to do because you don't know nothing about this. If we be honest with ourselves, we recognize that we're just a couple of three generations from where? Slavery. And on the plantation, we were not allowed to read and write. That was against the Constitution of the United States of America. It was against the laws of the states. Now, there's a few places up north where they allowed us to read a little taste, but even then, you couldn't read that which would give you the knowledge of yourself. So if I can read Chinese and don't understand what I'm reading, so what? It's almost like reading that which is transliterated. Uh, to read, <clears throat> if you open up the Holy Quran and here's Arabic, I cannot read but two or three words. I don't know what these symbols represent sound-wise. So down below, the writer puts some of the words in English, but it's not really English, it's English characters, letters, to give you the approximate or near to the sound equivalent. You follow me? Not the meaning. Well, not the meaning. You follow me? Now, if you tell black people, you go to any church, and you just stand up ignorant, and just say, look, get that GD, white Jesus, off your wall. Do this on Christmas Sunday, two weeks from now. Go to some big church and say, that's a GD lie. Say he was black and he's dead and he was not born of a virgin. How long do you think you'd be allowed to continue talking? Huh? That would be a stupid way a dumb way to try to convey the truth though each one of those statements is true he was born of a male and a female his mother certainly was not a virgin at least nine months before he was conceived the Bible and the Holy Quran back that up we've been lied to about it but that upsets people who don't know anything about the truth of it because we are emotionally involved with what we have been taught about Jesus. He's our ideal, our self-concept. The way in which we formulate friends and enemies and our worldview is determined by this concept we have in our brain about a man named Jesus. And this goes for all our people, even the so-called sophisticated ones who've outgrown religion going to prove that just in a minute. <clears throat> so it's true, but it would be a dumb way to, to try to convey the truth. Some of us in this room, perhaps, have leanings toward or we practice uh, Santa Clausism, meaning you lie to your children, you buy toys, and you put them under some tree in your house and you practice a lie. If Jesus was to come to America on Christmas Day, if he was to come here two weeks from now, I'm here, and in some way make everybody aware that he's here, how many people would be accepted? On Christmas Day, what happens? People get drunk. People overeat. Right? And on it goes. People just commit crimes <laughs> all over America on Christmas Day. Even And the children even are participating unknowingly in lies. The big man on that day is who? Santa Claus. And also depending upon what football game is being played on TV. Really something. So let's start getting into this material. 
I want to start with, I, re I was reading this piece earlier, uh, part of an interview that Mike Tyson gave. And one section really got to me. It took me back to the time when I was in the penitentiary. In this case, not for wrongdoing, but the American government wanted me to fight for them, and I thought that was stupid. They said, well, we put you in jail. I said, fine. I'd rather go to jail than to fight for them. So they put me in jail for five years, and then Allah blessed me to get out in two. At one point, <clears throat> the question he was asked, now, let me go back a little bit. The ring, what about your GED? I'm, I'm trying to put the part he said in some kind of context. What about your GED examination? When are you scheduled to take the retest? I don't know, you know, because I've passed it the first time. Are you saying you think they rigged the results? Tyson says, come on, please. They let they let everyone in here go before they let me go. They would keep me in here alone, the magazine. So you don't think you'll bother taking it again? He said, I may take it. I'm not caught up in no damn GED. I read all these damn books and they drove me out of my mind. I must have read over a hundred books. Now look, look at the books he said he read. Frederick Nietzsche, Tolstoy, Alexander Dumas. It drove me nuts. I'm out of my mind reading all of that so-and-so. It was good stuff, but I never looked at things from that kind of perspective. What do you mean good stuff? There's some truth in it, but it's the perspective that he said was what? He said driving him out of his mind. Now why? The brother is deep with wisdom, but he don't know it yet. He says, Nietzsche told me there is no God. They're just Superman. Man, I don't want to hear that crap. Tolstoy told me women ain't doo-doo. Machiavelli told me don't trust nobody. I already know that. Don't tell me I know this. I stopped right there. As I read that, my mind went back to my first night in the county jail. You all know what, what the county jail is. Don't act like you don't know what I'm talking about. 1961 November. My first night there. I'm faced with, not faced, I'm in there at that point in time for five years. I don't want to hear any foolishness. I'm get, I've already got my mind made up to do whatever this devil's going to have me do the whole 60 months or 60 years or whatever. And when you make your mind up like that, you, there's, there's a certain part of you you don't want touched. Some of you brothers, you're well aware of it, whether you went in for good or for evil. Now look, there's this big brother in the, in the, in the cell with me. It's two men cells. This is county jail. Now this is before they shipped me off to the federal, federal prison two weeks later. I got in there maybe about an hour before they cut the lights off. So they cut the lights off after an hour after the news was shown. And this brother said, well, young brother, what are you in here for? As it turned out, when I was in my early 20s, he was in, is about 38 years old at that time. So I said, well, I said, well, they said failure to report for induction. He said, oh man, you're a political prisoner. So that began the conversation. <clears throat> one thing led to another and he wanted he had heard something about the honorable Elijah Muhammad remember this is November 61 it's another world in a sense back then and as we talked back and forth he wanted me a very sharp brother to defend what I believed in well I didn't mind talking with him I was getting acquainted with his mind as, as vice versa and then at a certain point I began to see this brother was well read he just read, he read a lot. He was in and out of the joint all of his life since about 15 years old. Out of the joint, he did criminal activities. In the penitentiary, he read. <laughs> this conversation continued to about three o'clock in the morning and I got tired of it. And I, I said a certain curse word to him. I said, brother, I don't feel like talking to you no more. I said, I'm tired of your so-and-so. I'm going to sleep. I said, I don't see why they put me in my first night with you. I don't care what I said, I couldn't get this brother to see anything. Everything I said, he come, I come this way, he go that way. But he was very red. He knew all of the European rulers by name, like he knew them. I didn't know all that stuff and didn't give a damn about it. All those white people, century after century, who did in the same repetition, this one killed that one, that one had the throne, that one murdered, that one envy, jealousy. Just a whole history of criminality and wickedness. White folk stuff. But I don't need to read all of that. You follow me? So I said, brother, I call him a nigga, actually, because I was irritated. Wrong, but, you know, this talk. I said, brother, I'm going to sleep. 
I'm going to sum up what I believe in. You can take it or leave it. And then I just gave a quick summary of Moses and Aaron and Pharaoh and slavery and God, the ten plagues, the breaking of Pharaoh's power, the releasing of the people. It took about two, three minutes to say that. There was no more words exchanged between us till the next morning. Not even right away. Got up the next morning, had my coffee, went on. It must have been about an hour or two after that, there was a word exchange. And he said, man, his whole disposition had changed in those two or three minutes. All of that battling on his turf got me nowhere. I got him on my turf and it shut his mouth. I had realized not then, but in the course of the next, his whole attitude changed, the conversation got better, and we, we, we left each other a week later friends, and they put me in a different cell after that. I guess maybe they saw what I was, he was, he was becoming a convert. My point is, the lesson I got out of that, which this brought back to my mind, is this. And think on this carefully, brothers and sisters, so that the rest of what we're going to say will make adequate sense especially those of you visiting us for your first time. That steeped in all black folks is Bible. Bible is jammed into us. It started from slavery time. Now, I don't know what you and I were reading in Africa, if we were reading anything, depending upon what part of Africa we were in. That's not important. What is important is the white man brought us here and by reason of what they put us through, a brand new people were formed in the United States of America. That's, right. That's something that you got to understand That's right. about every brother and sister you see in this country. We're not Africans. And to call us African Americans is stupid and ridiculous and deceptive. 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 It's a tricky use of language that appears very innocent on the surface, like Polak American or Polish American or Spanish American. This is not like that. That's right. Why do they say African? Mm -hmm. That's the whole continent. That's right. All these other folks, the first name tells you something about the country. Right. They came where this American came from. What part of Africa did you and I come from? And then even if you could deal with that, then you're dealing with a whole continent named after some white man. You still are not out of the box yet. Right. Deceptive use of language, getting us away from saying black, which is far more intelligent to say. Right. You say, well, we're not all black. We're not black like this. But the nature of us in the beginning, but that produced this kind of color that we all used to have. We used to be this black. Some so black that you have you ever seen, maybe you see every now and then, a brother or sister looks so black they look purple black. We all used to be like that once upon a time. Yes, that is from a certain nature. Now our nature has not been changed. Coloring, yeah, nose, yes, a lot of things. Nature, no, same nature. Important point, you can one of the most important points we could ever understand. When you talk about self, you use the word self. That means nature. One of the most important words in the dictionary is yourself, myself, his self, herself, self. Most of the time when we use the word self, we talk about me as an individual. That's not what the word means unless you're talking about your nature. And if it's talking about you and my nature, then that's something we share with everybody else who looks like us. I hope that my blunt way of talking doesn't turn you off. But I don't, I just have to be what I am. But I want you to walk out with a clear picture and a clear understanding. And I want you to think it over. If not one of you accepts this, that's okay with me. I'm not your God. My duty is a clear delivery of what it is that I'm going to try to get over to you this afternoon. You do with it as you see fit. <clears throat> All praise is due to Allah. Now look, Mike Nietzsche, if you go and study all these white philosophers, there's, these, they're nothing to follow. None of them had perfect knowledge of what they were talking on. Not a one. If you read the life of the various European philosophers, you, you say, this is ridiculous. 
ridiculous. Look into their lives. You wouldn't follow any of them. None of them can, could have gotten you and I out of slavery. And they did not love us. And remember, all the European philosophers who so many of us bathe our brains in were in agreement on the whole idea of you and I being enslaved in the first right. place. So don't bring to me no white philosophers. I'm not interested. And even if you bring to me one that say he loved black folks, fine. I want to know how deep was his wisdom. Mm, go ahead. Tonight there's a program coming on called Fang. Fang or Fangs. You should watch it if you get a chance. The way the white people advertise it is animals killing animals. So people will sit and watch that gruesomeness. But they're missing the point. It is the white man's portrayal of that which he is not the author of. Mm. And it's a misportrayal. I, some of the program, they show the interrelationship between the various animals and their environment. But the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said something that I'm just going to touch very lightly. He said, if we study the plant, the animal life, the insect life, study the life, life forms on this earth, study then the earth out of which it comes and goes back to, study the atmosphere. He says, this will provide us the key to the way of life God intended for you and I, I to live. The way of nature itself, if understood, gives us a key, and a key is a big word, isn't it? To a whole way of life. What is the way of life God intended for us to live? A life free from incompetency. A life free from envy and jealousy. Can you imagine a world where people all love each other 100% of the time, 24-7. You sisters, some of you watch the soaps. Some brothers do too. I've sat and I've watched a few soaps to see what in the world is in this thing that attracts my mother years ago or still attracts her right now. What is this stuff? It's, it's nothing but utter corruption. Nobody loves anybody in the soaps. Everybody hates everybody else. The best relationships are corrupted. People, you see them smile, they're hugging each other, and then the camera shows this face where this face can't see, then you see this big frown. I hate you. <laughs> well, I don't like you. <laughs> Haven't you, do you see what I'm getting at? You, this is Hollywood, isn't it? This whole thing is Hollywood out here. <laughs> land of make-believe. The land where people are trying to show themselves to be what they're not because they want to be accepted. A land where people, more than most parts of the country, are sticking out their chest or whatever, trying to say, accept me, and there's nothing but hollowness on the inside. Hmm? People come here to what? Get their fame and what? What is that about? Fame. What the hell is fame? some star in the cement? What is that about? We're talking on Jesus. We're coming to Jesus in just a minute. Full, full force. My dear brothers and sisters, now two weeks from now, they said, they'll celebrate the 1,994th anniversary, they say, since Jesus was born. Isn't that what they say? And all the white man's books, you pick them up, it says he was born 6 B.C. Some used to say 4 B.C. And that means before Christ. How could Jesus Christ be born either four or six years or even one minute before he was born? Now, this is just a start now. Now, you can get this if you want to. If you get this, here's what you're going to find. The question was posed by Jesus himself. Who do you say that I am? St. Paul attempted to a an answer for him. All things to all men. And he was right. To some, Jesus is the son of God. Born to a virgin at this season, nearly 2,000 years ago, the anointed, the Christ. To others, he was just a man who inspired through his teachings and an, an exemplary life, several faiths now incorporated into Christianity and still others, he, he's a myth a novelistic invention of Paul and then the gospel writers who required a charismatic anchor uh, for their nascent churches 
He is, they say, an idea. Before we go further, you, you may not be able to see all of this, but here's all kind of pictures of it. This is the European, American, West African, Japanese, all kind of different Jesuses. A whole bunch of them. How did the man really look? I don't know if you can see this. It, it's, I mean, just different kinds of Jesuses. Swedish, Native American, even a female. Well, that's deep. <laughs> Come on. If you could go back there 2,000 years ago, what would you see? If you went back there when he was being born, did you see a, a birth like any other birth, right? What would tell you that this child was, was Jesus, Christ, this special being, the savior of the world? Now he's born and he's a few days old. I'm telling you, he didn't have no halo around his head. Forget about that. That's something white folks did later on in paintings. Mary didn't have this. Joseph didn't have this, and the, uh, what's his name? The baby didn't have this little round thing called a halo. Some of you all can see, some especially sisters who are a little sharp in certain areas, and some of us brothers, you say you can see auras. Fine. I guarantee you, no halo. Forget that. <laughs> now, whether idea or man, Jesus was a model that encouraged goodness, a mirror that reflects our hopes. Listen to these words. So far, these words are saying nothing. You hear what I'm saying? Yes, these people know how to write. And so far, these words say nothing. There's a white man whose book I read in the penitentiary called The Tyranny of Words by a man called Stuart Chase. And he was great at analyzing what he called blah words, words that carried the mind nowhere. And when a person who is knowledgeable gives you words that carry your mind nowhere, they're getting ready to reach into your pocket deeply so they can get somewhere. <laughs> now, we see Jesus as many different people, dutiful, son, ascetic, sage, martyr, depending upon our personal needs. Now, wait a minute. We, now, this is true. People in this world who are ignorant of the truth of the man see him in terms of their needs. Now, wait a minute. Here's the microphone. It's what it is. If I wasn't in this city and this thing was sitting there, it's sitting here, right? It's not what it is because I believe it. It is what it is because it is what it is. That's right. Go ahead. What do you mean Jesus is what we see him to be, what we want him to be, what we need him to be? Is that real? Suppose you're ignorant and poor and depressed, hardly have any friends, don't see no way out of your predicament. What kind of Jesus do you conjure up? Mm. Consider this, the writer goes on. If Jesus existed, he must have looked Semitic. What does that mean? A lot of Jews around here, regular looking white folks, with a certain look that makes you feel they're Jews. But white people, is that what they're talking about? Or something else? What do you mean, Semitic? But the masterpieces of European religious art did not portray him that way. Now that word hints what? That he wasn't looking like a white man. The next sentence says, the African knows a dark-skinned Jesus. The Swede, a blonde one. Americans picture the bearded Jesus of a billion prayer book covers. Look at the pieces of art on the facing page. That's this other page over here. We see Jesus in our own image. It helps us to know him. Wait a minute. We see Jesus in our own image and it helps us to know him and to understand him. Look at the words here. This is a game. That's right. These people are filled with lies. That's right. If a man will lie to you about God, he'll lie to you about everything else. That's right. Allah, help us to, to know what others think of it. To that end, Life magazine interviewed eminent thinkers. What kind of thinkers? Eminent. What do you what's that mean? Smart people. Including scholars, historians, theologians, clergy, and an atheist. Their testimony makes one point clear. Whether he lived or not, died on the cross or not, ascended or not, Jesus is alive in our time. That's double talk. Huh? In other words, what the white man is saying, the truth about the man don't make no difference. He's alive in our time. What are you talking about? One thing, black folks all got to come out of his double talk. That's right. 
to believers and non-believers alike, Jesus matters. Now that's true. If you're going to try to help black folks, you got to deal with Jesus. I don't care how much you help us in this, that, or the other field. Where it counts at the root of us is our spiritual selves. No such thing as a moral deficiency without a spiritual deficiency sitting up under it. Correct? And all of us got spiritual deficiencies. That's right. This teaching, Elijah Muhammad calls this teaching spiritual teaching. What does that mean? What is that? Something like that? What does spiritual teaching mean? Ask the average brother or sister, a lot of us in the mosque, what is your spirituality? We can't define it. If that's your nitty gritty out of which everything comes of value, what is it? Now the Holy Quran says, of that we are given but little knowledge. Why? Because the white man's been in power. And the white man is the real devil. And if the devil had the power that makes God, God, that would be the end of God. That's put blunt. I could put it in a nice fancier way, but I want to be sure you walk out of here. Whatever you're going to do with this, that's up to you. You know the white man's the devil. Is that bad talking? No. Is that going contrary to the teachings of Minister Farrakhan? No. We don't spend as much time on that because that's pretty much understood. Throughout America, it's, it's as American as apple pie. It's becoming that way. White folks know it. Everybody knows it. Everybody knows that Muslims regard white folks as devils. And Minister Farrakhan's part of his overall task is to give them a break, help them get out of being an active devil. If they will accept his advice. And some of them are, have, some are, and a few more will. The majority will not. They're going to wind up straight in the fire. That's not, that's not, our, our, that's not our worry. We have enough to take care of ourselves. Well. <laughs> they are white believers, though. We have mentioned four times in the six written lessons we're given. We are to respect them. Any man or woman trying to do right in, in America has to be respected. I don't care how many times we stumble and fall. We're living in hell. Oh, you didn't know this was hell? You, are, you will not die and go to hell. You will not die and go to hell. That's not going to happen. When the white man brought us over here, we've been taught by the Amalaj Muhammad, he brought us over here and killed us in our head. And then we went to hell. And we've been in hell for the whole 400 hundred some odd years. Being stabbed and pitchforked and whatnot by the white man who is the devil. This is, this is where hell is, right here. When you go in the ground, nothing happens. That's right. They take you there. Nobody ever goes in the grave on your own. You are taken and buried and that's it. He said, but I think I'm coming back. That's just what you think. You think that as long as you're alive, but when you die, you don't, I'll have to tell you like it is. Go ahead. You will not think anymore. That's right. Go ahead. No more thinking. You're just dead. It's best that we look at it like it is. That's blunt, that's hard, that's cold, that's rough. But when you're dead, you're done. What's the value of knowing that? Then you start appreciating your life more. You say, well, I'm going to stay here. I like this. I don't want to commit suicide. I don't give a damn how bad things are. I got, I, there's some way I can get out of this. Just because I don't see how to get out of it, that don't mean some brother or sister can't, don't see, uh, doesn't see what I don't see. I can get out of it if I'm alive. Solomon said a living dog is better than a dead lion. There's no praise of thee in the grave. That's right. Don't die. Try to stay here as long as you can. Forget about dying. Try to stay alive. That's right. I don't care how much your mother, I love my mother as much as you love yours. I go back to Phoenix and learn that she's dead. I'm going to be, I'm going to be hurt for several reasons in my case. But if she's dead, mm, I have to bury mama. I do not expect to leave that grave site and go someplace else and see mama again. I don't expect that. Either I, I, I mean, that would blow me away. Some kind of deep David Copperfield thing had to have gone down. 
You follow me? Oh, that wasn't my mother who died. I'm sorry, let's just face that like it is. When you're dead, that's it. You have a roach in your house, you go home at night, turn on the light, there's a roach on the counter, the light strikes the roach, the roach freezes. Danger. The roach wants to stay here. You hit somewhere close to the roach, he's trying to figure which way to run. That's right. He wants to stay here. That's right. And that's in your nature too. The nature of everything alive is to stay here as long as we can. Yes, sir. There's something in your nature This tells you I don't know about coming back. You talk that till, till it's time to face that. You follow me? Please, now let's get away from that foolishness. That's as much a lie as you believe in and I believe in that a 300-pound white man's going to jump down everybody's chimneys two weeks from now and give everybody toys all over America regardless of the time zone and do it at the same time. Please. It's a lie. Straight up lie. Don't use the word fairy tale. Say it like it is. Lie. 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 Jesus had nothing to do with no Santa Claus. Stuff was invented in Europe and brought over here by white people. I'm, I'm going to read just what some of these white people have said. I don't know if any of these are black or not, but all these names, as far as I know, they're white people. I'm just going to read a few of them. I just want you to see, these are eminent, big-time white folks that others follow. Reverend Michael Horton, pardon me, he's an evangelical minister, says, quote, the whole Christian faith rests on a scheme of redemption. It's not about men and women climbing up to God. It's about God descending to save the rebel race. God appeared in the flesh, coming down to us because we had proved we couldn't save ourselves. That's almost entirely true. The words. Now, I, I know his application is 100% wrong, but the words devoid of his application is almost entirely true. Peter A. Bien, B-I-E-N, professor of English at Dartmouth College, I don't think we know who Jesus was. The Gospels, which was, were written for political purposes to convert people, are after the fact, 50 years at least. Mary? Well, obviously he had a mother, so it had to be somebody. Her name doesn't matter. Then, one gospel writer says he was born in Nazareth. The other says Bethlehem. Joseph might have been a shoemaker, not a carpenter. Some traditional traditions say Jesus had brothers. Others say Joseph had no other children. What difference does it all make? The gospel writers were novelists, writing a story about a child who really was born, but more important, a story with a message worth hearing. I realize much of what we know about Jesus is novelistic, but I act as if it isn't. A lot of people think just like this. Truth don't make no difference. Hmm? John Murray, president of the American Atheist. There was no such person in the history of the world as Jesus Christ. There was no historical living, breathing, sentient human being by that name, ever. The Bible is fictional, non-historical narrative. The myth is good for business. Hmm. Bishop John Spong, who by the way, by the way, and incidentally wrote a book that says Jesus was a married man. He married a man named a woman named Mary, Mary Magdalene. I just mentioned that incidentally. He's a bishop. Uh, the Episcopal Bishop of Newark, New Jersey. He wrote a book called Born of a Woman. If Paul was going to create a, a, a person out of whole cloth, he never would have located him in this scrubby, dirty little Galilean town. I don't. I, he must have said more than that. Why they only got this little small quote, I don't know. And I don't see what value that makes to this whole point. I don't know. Kevin R. O'Neill, who's a Buddhist monk, president of the American Buddhist Movement, says the value for a Buddhist comes not from proving whether or not he, he did exist. His significance lies in the lessons of the Jesus story. The scholar in me keeps going back to wondering if he ever, if he existed. But as a Buddhist, I say values are more important than flesh and blood facts. If people say he existed, then he existed because the lessons of his life that we are told about are important indeed. Now, do you know most people who really have given the subject thought and have read about Jesus, what the scholars have produced? That the people who preach in churches go and study from the scholars but don't represent them in their congregation. But if you study what they teach in seminaries, in the seminaries, then the entire teaching in the church would be different. 
the way Jesus is taught in the church, he's live and real. But what those same brothers and sisters study in the seminary, you don't, they don't know about that. You hear what I'm saying? I'm saying it blunt to your faces now. Even if you're brand new to this. When you go to church or you watch the white folks and some of the brothers on the television, they're talking Jesus like they, like they know him personally. But what did they study when they went to school? It's another story. That's interesting. Even Martin Luther King. If you look at what Martin Luther King studied in the seminary at Boston College, it's not what he taught in the churches. Okay? Mm, 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 mm. Robert H. Eisenman, Dead Sea Scroll scholar, professor of Middle Eastern religion at California State University at Long Beach. He's out, out here somewhere. The scrolls give us an un unadulterated picture of Palestine in the first century. Seething with political revolution, discontent, warfare, crucifixion, Jesus is always referred to as being from Nazareth in Galilee. But that is a reinterpretation by gospel editors based on geography. Actually, Nazarite, Nazarite and Galilean are words for members of a political messianic group. The scrolls indicate that the kind of group he would have been born into was dedicated to God in a very extreme purist manner with a large set of Puritan regulations, vegetarianism, never eating unclean foods, particularly bathing practices. I place Jesus, if he existed, among these groups, probably the cult that included James, the scroll's chief character, and a man often seen as Jesus' brother. Think on those words, if, if he existed. Richard Miller, spokesman for the Brethren of Christ in Brethren in Christ World Mission, says, the Bible is the fundamental way to view him. There was a virgin birth. Jesus was born all powerful. Stop. Born all powerful. Born all powerful. Born what? All powerful. A baby four days old has very little arm power. A baby four days old can't lift this book. Hmm? That's right. That's right. I want to know if this is true, how did this baby, what kind of power did this baby have? Or does he mean potential? Good question, huh? He was brought here to save man. He was God made flesh, walking the earth. He was man and God. A lot of people believe that, right? A lot of people believe that. Man and God. Caption up here. A child was born, or was he? This caption. Did the boy grow to be a man or a god? People are generally confused about what Jesus was. He, he was definitely a man, but he was also God. People pray to Jesus, don't they? And some pray to the Father, but they invoke the Son. Do they not? Why such a mix-up? Why is it people don't have it clear? If the man was the way, the life, and the truth, why are Christians confused? Forget about non-Christians, just Christians. Why is it Christians argue with each other about Jesus? Why aren't Christians united in their view of Jesus? Re Reverend Jerry Farwell, pastor of the Thomas Road Baptist Church in Lynchburg, Virginia. Jesus grew up in Nazareth in the home of his mother Mary and her husband, Joseph, who was not his father. Problem right there. <laughs> Joseph was a carpenter. I believe that he, Jesus, learned the trade of carpentry like any other Jewish boy would have, would have in such a home. I, now stop right there, Jewish boy. I'm not going to argue that right now, but I want to raise this question, which is in, in the book called This is the One, which I just touched it lightly. Because more and more books are coming out, I notice, raising the question of Jesus' relationship to females. Hmm serious subject. There's a woman, I just picked up a book, I threw it in the back of the car, I'll read it when I get back, by some woman scholar who just studied this, he scrolls, I don't know fully what it says, but on the back of it, you know, the back of the book, it says several things, among which is that he had two wives. This woman wrote that. I'll call you back the name, you can go read it for yourself if you want to. Interesting, isn't it? And I guess you all saw that movie, or you heard about that movie called, um, huh? The last what? Last temptation. And the implication is that the women are the temptation. 
temptation and therefore evil and therefore the devil and bad. And therefore, we should beat hell out of y'all because y'all messed it up by giving us the apple. Isn't that the way they run it? Huh? And a lot of women believe that stuff. And some women way back then got an apple from a serpent. We don't know how the serpent held on to the apple. Or maybe he just pointed the apple with his nose or his face and said, go bite. She took the apple, bit part, gave it to Adam, and then they both got messed up. God came up on them and caught them in a bad condition and gave them hell. Sent them out of the garden. We don't know how the serpent got in the garden. We don't know how this evil got in the garden. But all we know is this was supposed to be the Garden of Eden. And Garden of Eden, Eden, Eden equals so-called heaven. Yet in this garden, there was something evil, but we're not told how that happened. And it's just one of those things we have in the back of our brains that we grew up with and don't understand it. When you get to be 99, you still don't know nothing about what it really means. And yet we say we're all from Adam. But we gotta, there's a lot of garbage we got to get rid of and fast. God's chastisement is about to come down on this insane country the full, with full force. Not just, not just what's going on now, which is rough enough but the complete outpouring of God's wrath. And it depends on how they treat Minister Farrakhan. I'm going to explain that clear as I know how in the bluntest language I can muster in just a moment. I'm coming up to my brother right now. I hope that you're able to take it. It's not, not as much detail as I did the last two talks. I still hope you walk out of here with the, your stomach not messed up. Jewish boy. Well, if you read about Jewish boys, when they're around 13, 14 years old, their parents put the idea of marriage on their mind. It's part of what's happening. It's part of being a Jewish boy. Jesus had to, if he was a Jew, he had to deal with y'all, females, at some point. Did you hear what I just said? He had to make a decision. That's a big subject. And by God's grace, next time I come, that's what I'm going to get to. That's what I'm going to get to. I did it only one other time since I've been a Muslim in this side of what we call Calvary, and that was in Washington, D.C., but we got to deal with that. You can't talk about Jesus and not deal straight up with Jesus and females. If it don't be for females, no church, right? If the sisters leave the church, the church closes down. Boom! <laughs> Everybody's out of business. If it don't be for the sisters hollering and screaming in the church house, there's nothing happening there, right? Even, even in 94, I visit a few churches, and, and the brothers have it mostly dead. It's most, if it just depended on the brothers, it's a dead thing. Little churches and big churches. The women are the ones making the noise. A joyful noise under who? Hmm. And this Lord is called Jesus. Not to, not to the Father. Not making no joyful noise to God the Father. But it's Jesus. The Holy Ghost is out of the picture. In fact, the Holy Ghost is something vague, isn't it? Vague. Mysterious. Ghost-like. I got the Holy Ghost. How can you have the Holy Ghost and yet he's someplace else? He's God. That's that double talk again, huh? He's one-third of God. He's part of the God's head and yet you got him. And you got him and you're in bad shape. Please. A lot of straightening up. Short time to do it in. I believe that he ran and played with friends as a child. I believe he enjoyed good food and fun and frolicking with his buddies and pals. The gospel say he grew in stature and in wisdom. At the age of 12, he confounded the wise men in the temple. I believe he developed physically and mentally in the same way as any other child and yet stood above any other child. He never once yielded to sin, nor was he at any time susceptible to injury or harm or hurt from anything, mortal or otherwise. He explored creation although he was uh, at the same time the creator. Straighten that up. Come on, straighten it up. You mean to say that 2,000 years ago God was born, the same one who created the heavens and the earth? But a lot of people in church believe that, correct? It's part of the thinking of a lot of folks who go to church because that's what they're taught. They don't know this directly. They're taking the word of the person who is talking to them. You don't know this directly. You wasn't there when creation began. Don't talk like you talking in the first person, like you got direct knowledge. None of us, ain't nobody in this room 100 years old, right? 
Nobody in this room, if you're 100 years old, raise your hand. Nobody in here even cracked a century. So none of us know nothing about the origin of creation except what somebody tells you. And if even if you're a deep enough scientist, you are inferring from something somebody else already did. Now the one who began the creation knows best what he did. Who is he? Jesus? Mm. Peter A B N B I E N. What contestances? This man, I can't pronounce this Greek man's name, who wrote the book, The Last Temptation of Christ, is saying in this book, and what I'm com comfortable with is this, that this is a human being growing up, not a unique son of God. So this man, this Greek man who wrote that book, denies the divinity of Christ, but, contradic but contradiction doesn't bother him. He is also saying that there is something divine in the world, and this divinity can be seen and understood through Jesus. Jesus is a model, the supreme model. Now, here's a Unitarian minister who has authored a book called God and Other Famous Liberals. F. Period Forrester Church. That's his name. He says, Ralph Waldo, Waldo Emerson, a Unitarian, was a spiritualist, as Jesus was. Emerson believed that Jesus was one deeply in touch with what Emerson called the Oversoul. He thought Jesus divine precisely to the extent that we are divine. The difference being Jesus recognized it and most of us don't. Most of the rest of us don't. We can't see it in ourselves easily, so we have to recognize it in others. There's a lot of truth in that, isn't it? So when we gaze into his eyes, we would see divine eyes. We would see our own eyes. When we, when we saw his tears, we would recognize our own. And when we saw the elegance of his actions and the simplicity of his teachings, and the essence of his loving kindness, we would recognize our own, and then we would be changed into that which we had already already were, but had lost sight of until it was revealed to us. Very thought-provoking words there. What does it tell us? What does it tell us really about the nitty-gritty of the man? I don't know because they only have a portion of what he said. But you can just see from a little bit, and all, also what you already know. There's a lot of different kind of views about Jesus. Now. John Cardinal O'Connor. Connor, Archbishop of New York. This is a, a priest, Catholic priest. I don't see how, without the gift of faith, you would believe he was the Son of God. Faith makes the difference. You can study the scriptures till your eyes fall out. Without the gift of faith, you're not going to believe Christ was the Son of God. The miracle, the miracle is faith itself. Now, what is faith? What is his definition of it? Does it mean like so many other many people say, I just trust what you say without any evidence at all? Is that the faith? Or is it something like this faith in the book of Hebrews? What does it mean? We're living in a country where double speak and playing with words goes on daily. But where it goes on concerning God, that's deadly. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad said there was no way for us to get the truth of God, not the real truth of it. And if Jesus is the package containing the truth about God, then there's no way to learn about God without understanding Jesus and vice versa. And in dealing with Jesus, dear brothers and sisters, you got to deal with his birth, the birth process. You got to deal with his upbringing. And if he is God, how did he develop those kind of powers, whatever they are. It's a great subject to get into. But it's a subject which, if, if, as he said it to us, if you don't understand it or if you misunderstanding after hearing it, it's worse than if you had never heard it at all. And now you're in a worse condition. Because to be told the truth about the subject and to misunderstand it or to say it, I don't believe this. Now you're putting yourself in a horrible position because you got to deal with the one the reality of whom you've just been presented with. And that man is the judge. Wouldn't it be a shame if what the Honorable Elijah Muhammad taught us all this time is not true? Wouldn't it be, wouldn't it be a horrible thing? That the black man is not who we were taught he was, that the white man is really not the devil. This world is not really ancient Babylon, I'm warmed over. That this is really 
heaven and we're supposed to integrate with white folks a way for them to give us freedom, justice, and equality regardless of how long it takes. And white folks now in bad shape. And you know how they are. They were never going to deal with you and I first. They deal with themselves first. So after they get themselves up in better shape then maybe they'll think about us. I mean, if our whole hopes depend on white people and the UN, God, this is rough. There's another program coming on CNN tonight about slavery. I hope I'm able to see it. About slavery. There's slavery going on right here in America. They're going to show a form of it somewhere down in the South. But they have slaves here in Los Angeles. Every brother and sister who don't know who you are, you're a slave to white folks. You say, no, I'm not. I got a lot of money. I drive a BMW. You're a BMW driving slave. That's all. Come, come to that in just a second. Very clear. All praise is due to Allah. If you don't know who you are and don't know the value of knowing who you are, you are subject to those who know who you are. Not to know who you are puts you in a position to be used by anybody whenever they get ready. Here's another man whose name, first name I can't pronounce, but the second name is P-E-L-I-K-A-N. He's a professor of Yale, of history at Yale University. Wrote a book called Jesus Through the Centuries. He says, there was a great teacher and gathered, and gathered around him was a small group of faithful followers. They listened to his message and were transformed by it. But the message alienated the power structure of his time, which finally put him to death, but didn't succeed in eradicating his message, which is stronger now than ever. What is his message? Hmm? Ask people, what is Jesus' teaching? God is love. Explain that. Explain that. Explain God is love in the face of what's going on in America and, and in the face of our enslavement. So never forget, white folks brought us over here and have never even apologized. And you're going to tell me you know about God being love and you got it from the same people who won't even say, I'm sorry? We don't owe you niggas nothing. My, I didn't do nothing to you. Apologize to the Japanese and give them money. Apologize to this group of the Indians and everybody, even the Hawaiians give himself. But when it comes to us, we're not even worth an apology. Not even an insincere apology. Think on it. They haven't even offered us an insincere apology for slavery. Isn't that something? <laughs> boy, oh boy. When this thing, when this thing is over, I guess you all know that, uh, that Minister Farrakhan is leading a million black brothers to Washington, D.C. You all know that, don't you? You think white folks love that? You think you, you think that's going to bring the issue of white and black and slavery and freedom and justice and equality and reparations right in everybody's face? Is it possible to 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 do a news blackout on a million brothers going to Washington D.C.? Not possible. <laughs> Boy, and think on all the brothers and sisters that are being asked do nothing on that day, stay home on that day. Uh oh, this is a showdown year coming up, isn't it? Huh? You think white folks like this? Some white folks say, get on, Farrakhan. And others are saying, something else. You think we're not coming to the showdown? Now, a lot, a lot depends on how they deal with our brother. <clears throat> the white folks are, are like a man. I have never put my hands in this stuff, and I don't want to. But they have a thing called iron glue. Once you grab that, you're in deep trouble. You have to go to the emergency ward to get that stuff. I'm told, I don't know the truth of it, to get it off. If you grab something that has iron glue on it, like if I grab this mic and it has iron glue on it, my, I grab it, I got to go to the emergency ward or oh, lose part of my hand. Is that what you heard too? Well, the way this thing called the Nation of Islam is coming up in this country, the white folks have already grabbed us. They have embraced us, but they're trying to kill us. And while they're trying to kill us, they got a grip on us now. They got a big grip on us. There's still 100 white men or more who are paid by the government to just follow the minister and check everything he says and does every day. I don't know what I don't know what's happening to their mind. Maybe they have another crew Cause, <laughs> on it. But as they as they're grabbing this thing called the nation of Islam, it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. 
bigger and bigger. It's, it's a problem. This is something they can't let go of. Remember, white folks today got to deal with us. We are a big problem. Not only are we a problem to ourselves and each other, but we are a big problem to this government. We are the biggest problem America got. And it's not Russia. It's not poverty. It's not the economy. All no, it's none of that. It's us. This is the problem. You and I are like Jonah in that boat. And this ship went, went crazy because the waters wouldn't let, I mean, the ship couldn't go nowhere until they got rid of that man. Oh, boy, oh, boy. We're here now. We're full-grown, full-grown Negroes. That's a fact. All of us who haven't woke up yet, we're still dead. But a dead man with a high degree of this white man's education, and we're all over the place. We all over his, his we in his, we in everything he's in, we in. Recently, they even had a brother on the front cover of, of Fortune magazine, buried deep in corporate America, a genius, genius brother, dead as hell. Probably drinks, eats pig, a genius, and somebody who they need to make go whatever it is that they got going in that particular corporation. We all over the place. We just have we through no desire, no plan, we have just infiltrated all over. We're all over the place, aren't we? Did you know that we are all in the White House? And some of us in the White House read the final call intensively and smile. We all over the place. We all in the Pentagon and read the final call and love it. Be surprised. There's nothing that white folks are thinking or, or, or talk about that some brother don't or sister don't hear. Just like when Minister Farrakhan, by God's grace, got back in the country without the government knowing how, they, how he did it in 1986. I know for a fact because he showed it to me. We were in Chicago and he came down to my room and said, man, look at this. It was a document. Some brother or some sister high up somewhere got us a document. He got to the minister. He showed it to me. Years later, we were so sorry that he told me to destroy it after I read it, but I wish I had I disobeyed him. Because we wish we had that today. <laughs> but it was a document, and I can't remember the exact word, but the idea was to, to catch the minister had all the ports, all the ways you can get in this country, loaded up with people who were instructed to cause a ruckus to get him killed. And they don't know this to this day how he got back in the country. Don't you think they, they're still thinking about that one? What kind of man? How did, he, how did this happen? Something is very, very, very special going on in this country. Brothers and sisters, I hope, I wish to God we could just snap our finger and you, you and I could see instantly who we are and how valuable we are in the sight of Almighty God. Each one of us. And you know, that even those of us who've been in this teaching for a while, we're still struggling with our self-concept. We need to speed up this process fast. We're wasting a lot of time. I'm telling you that March should be here before you know it. Now, are white folks going to interfere with this before it happens? I mean, if you was a white man or a white woman, how would you feel? Farrakhan leading a million black men to Washington, D.C. Based on all that you know about Farrakhan, is he serious? <laughs> is he just making a political move? That man means that. There's nothing in his background that says he don't go out there like that and don't mean it. He mean that. And a lot of folks like that idea. A lot of brothers love it. This is an interesting situation. Now, what white folks going to do about this? Where does this man Farrakhan get this kind of moxie? Huh? I mean, where did you get that kind of courage? Where did you get that idea from? This is an unusual brother. And he is leading an unusual group who are expanding one way or another, even in our raggedy condition. We expand. A lot of brothers and sisters learning about this message every day and are affected by it every day, all over the place, throughout the entire country. I'm laying on that for a minute for a big reason. Now, this white man says this. 
They listened to his message and were transformed by it. But the message alienated the power structure of his time, which finally put him to death. But he did not, but did not succeed in eradicating his message, which is stronger now than ever. The description would apply equally to Jesus and Socrates, but nobody's ever built a cathedral in honor of Socrates. Socrates called on people to think straight, but with Jesus, there's more than just teaching. There's a transcendental dimension beyond the here and now as a source of hope and meaning. But yet this is the man, according to what we were told in the book of John, behind the scenes, Caiaphas and the others decided to kill this man. But they had to be careful because they feared the people. And the same thing is repeated in the life of Paul. There was a group that even determined they were going to go on a long fast and wouldn't even eat until they killed him. There are people right now who've already decided Farrakhan must be killed. But we got to do this, they're thinking, in a way that, that they don't show who did it. Got to put it on blacks. It can't come out that white folks had anything to do with this. If you, if you do something to him and you don't succeed, he's still alive, he can still talk. He's dangerous. You got to kill him in such a way so that the movement he represents dies. This is going on right this minute. Can't get no deeper than this the biggest or the best or the most dramatic script that has ever been produced wasn't produced in Hollywood. It's right in that Bible and the Holy Quran that we are living through right now. Right. Cardinal O'Connor, even if people just look at him humanistically and say, he said a marvelous example as a peacemaker, as a loving, charitable individual whom anyone could model himself or serve herself on, that would be good. That's a contribution. What peace did Jesus make? Who did he make peace with? Who did Jesus make peace with? Come on. Explain it. Explain it. Where's the peace? Where is the peace that he made? He said, think not that I come to bring peace. I come with a sword. And he said he came to divide even family members up against one another. Right. Mm. That throws this man's comment out the window. Harvey Cox, professor of religion, just four more to go, and, and society at Harvard Divinity School, author of a book called Fire from Heaven. Gandhi said that what he found most attractive about Jesus was that he wasn't just someone who taught it, as many of the, as of the age Asian sages did. He did it. He actually lived it. He loved his neighbors, his enemies. He stayed among the poor. He was an example of his own teaching. Now, does staying just among the poor make you godly? Hmm? Come on, let's explain this. This is, not, this is not adequate. He loved his enemies. Okay, if he loved his enemies, then and if he's God and he changes not, why is he going to kill his enemies on his return? Hmm? Explain that. A lot of contradictions. Huh? And then Robert Funk, founder of G the Jesus Seminar, which examines the authenticity of the gospel, says Jesus was a subversive sage. His witticisms tended to undermine the everyday view of things. Jesus taught them. If someone sues you for your coat, give them your shirt as well. In a two-garment society, that would be funny. Hmm. Well... Helmut, Helmut, uh, I can't pronounce his name, K-O-E-S-T-E-R, professor of New Testament at the Harvard Divinity, author of Ancient Christian Gospel. Jesus' philosophy in the context of his time was, no historian wants to use the word unique, but it was striking. One example, if you lend money to someone, don't ask to get the money back. It's a new philosophy. Love your enemies. Well, everyone in Rome was saying you better hate your enemies. It was a singular philosophy. Isn't this cheap stuff? What's, what's so deep about this? If that's all this man taught, this is nothing. Not only is it nothing, it's highly impractical. Love your enemies. Just straight up love your enemies. How can you have the same emotional reaction to an enemy as you do to a friend? 
To do that, you have to destroy what makes a human being a human being. You follow me? You have to destroy your nature. This is foolishness. God, does God love the devil? Why not? Why not? If, if Jesus is from God, why not? a quote is a Muslim professor of Islamic studies at George Washington University. He says, Muslims see him as the greatest prophet before the prophet of Islam. He is the prophet of inward spiritual life. Jesus did not do what Moses did. Jesus in his lifetime did not liberate anybody except his a few followers. Right? On the face of it, he was inferior to Moses. So in what way was he superior? The Muslims who read the Holy Quran don't have clear that most of what is taught here about the Jesus is not talking about any man who lived 2,000 years ago. This is the biggest key, the thing that our people need to learn. And you, it's hard to do this from the speaker stand. It's more easily something that you can be wrote out or something where people are come to a kind of a meeting, not to sit for an hour or two, but like a seminar where you have tables and you have coffee, where you can get into it because there are certain details that are ordinarily boring to an audience. Yet without those details, you never can get people to really see that the man who was here 2,000 years ago is dead. But what you have in your Bible and Quran, most of those words is talking about a man to come after that man's time. Now let me give you a simple example. Revelation 12. This, this we can all see real quick. Though it's not the kind of details I like to get into. I like to get into deeper details. But look at this. If you believe. Let me have that black book. Can I get that board a minute please? Please help me with that thing over here. There's something to write with. I just want to give you a picture. If a picture is worth a thousand words. And if you can get around this one point. Then I'll, I'll quit Islam. But I don't think you can. I want to be sure I'm heard all the way through on this. Marker, give me something to write with, please. Now look, Jesus, they say, was born at the beginning of a particular century, 4 B.C., 3 B.C., 2 B.C., 6 B.C., whatever. Then he grew up and died 30-some years into that century. Correct? You follow me? We're in agreement. That's what they say. That's what we've been told by white folks. Please hurry. Then, with the chalk or whatever, something to write with. I can't do it with my fingers. Now look. <clears throat> then, he died. He was seen by his followers for a few days. And then he ascended to God. The picture we always have is, he went up in the sky. And he went through a cloud. The last thing they saw was his feet. And the white folks always picture him as sandalless, no, just barefoot. Jesus going on up. How? Never is explained. Right? But that's what we have. That's what we've been taught. Haven't you been taught that? Okay. Now he's with God. His followers are down on earth, and the Peter and Paul and all the rest of them. They deal. Well, maybe I can just make the picture clear with my mouth. Now, toward the end of that century, around 96 or 98 A.D., toward the end, some 60-some years after he left the scene, one of his followers is named John, and he's exiled to an island called Patmos. And on that island, Jesus generates visions into his head, and he writes them down. Now, in the 12th chapter of that book called Revelation, which we've all been told was, is mostly vision. This man, Jesus, appears to this man. You've had a dreams, haven't you? End of time. Revelation concerns the end of time. Right? Okay. 
Jesus, born. Whatever year this is, and dies 33 plus years later. It's not clear, it's all a lot of argument about what year it was. But now, 60 some years later, here's John on the island of. Thank you. I can't. End of the world. End of what world? End of what world? The end of everything that's going on? Complete wipeout? Or the end of the power of certain people to rule? Regardless of one's, what, what, what one thinks about it, it's going to be the end. And this man, Jesus, is going to come back. Now, in the 12th chapter, he's given a vision of activity in heaven. And in heaven, there's a woman pregnant. This pregnant woman is carrying a boy child, man child, male. She's clothed with the sun, stars under her feet. Obviously, that's not literal. It's a vision. No such thing as a woman inside the sun, stars under her feet. That's not real. We ain't even going to argue that. It's just a lie if you take it literally. But as a vision, something else is involved woman child a baby pregnant Revelation 12 up until recently Catholics and many other Christians were teaching that this child is Jesus here you have Jesus talking to John nearly 2,000 years ago 60 plus years after he died and went to the father he comes back to this man appears to him talks to him generates visions in his head about the end when he's to come back and gives the man the knowledge in a vision of a woman Mary with Jesus being born way down here explain that Mm, interesting, isn't it? Jesus' ancestral background is uh, traced through Joseph. Yet, Joseph is not the father. He had nothing to do with it. He did not make that woman pregnant. And yet, the baby's ancestral tree is traced back through Joseph, who did not make Mary pregnant. Explain that. You cannot explain a lie. You can just tell it. Now, this woman, after the baby is born, then a dragon stands before the woman. The dragon is trying to do in the child. The dragon is after the child to kill the child because if the child grows up and gets power, then the dragon is done for. Interesting, isn't it? What does it mean? This is one of the ways we could go into showing that there is a Jesus to come at the end, but not the man who was here 2,000 years ago. If you take this literally, then you got two Jesuses. Here you got one that died, went up to the Father, and then told John about another Jesus coming. Now at the end of the world, you got a problem here. You got Jesus who's already in heaven, than another one being born. You have a lie here, but under the lie there's tremendous truth. So here we got two Jesuses at the end. This one presumably, he gonna stay alive all the way to the end. Muslim world, about a billion Muslims right now, because of how they understand the Holy Quran, they believe Jesus, who was there 2,000 years ago, is alive and will return with one under this name, M. A-H-D-I, the self-guided one who comes to guide others. He'll come with Jesus, two of them, and they're going to straighten out the planet. This man has a function with this man. Muslim world now believes this. This man, Esau in Arabic, has a function or a job in association with this man. This man gives him his job. 
But the way we were told is that this man's been here 2,000 years. That's so mixed up. The Christians believe the same way. In the church, isn't that what you believe? Jesus has been here 2,000 years. He used to return. And yet you got another Jesus coming? So you got two Jesuses, at least two, right there. This is one of the many ways to get into this thing. But when you get past the problems, the emotional problem of saying, I don't want my Jesus tampered with, don't mess with my Jesus. If we could just get past that, we could walk through a lot of truth. But the problem is, you and I are hung up on a lie emotionally. That's the problem. So even when we recognize the lie to be a lie, we hold on to it because I like it. I, my feelings are hurt because now I know Santa Claus is not real. My mama, you know what I mean? Do you see what I'm getting at? All praise is due to Allah. Oh, there's some other passages that would take us into this very deeply, but this, for those of you who are new to this, I hope that this gets you thinking a little deeper than the way we ordinarily think about a very big, big subject. Now, what's the truth of it all? You read in the Bible that Peter made a speech. His speech at the very beginning of what they call, uh, on the day of what they call Pentecost, 50 days after Jesus left, Jesus, Peter made a speech in defense of himself and those with him. Did he not? Called the day of Pentecost. In that speech in the third chapter of Acts, he quotes liberally from the book of Joel. Everybody who's ever commented on the book of Joel, I don't care Jewish, Muslim, or otherwise, they all say that Joel, in his three, three chapters that make up his book in the Old Testament, is talking about that which would take place at the end of the world. Peter quotes Joel as if the end is back then, 2,000 years ago, but you know the end didn't come. That's one of many passages that you can read in the Bible you got in your house. First Corinthians chapter 10, I think, and Romans 12. The writers write as though the end was in their day, and you know the end didn't come back then. So what are we dealing with? Broadly speaking, you're dealing with people who thought something but were mistaken. And God allowed that because he was not going to interfere with Satan's time. But God allowed his own word to be tampered with and, and to be mistranslated and to be evil spoken of for thousands of years. Yet you got Bible and Quran still here. You got a Bible, somebody's Bible for a minute. So you got these two books. Now here's the heavy part. This, this open your mind wide up. Both these books talk about the dead to be raised in the last day. A lot of different ways it does it. You know what's, what, what the nitty gritty of all this is about, the upshot, the end of all of this? Is that the dead, the lost, the messed up people, the lost sheep in these books is us. That's right. We are written up in both books from cover to cover. Muslims in this country who, black people who become uh, uh, Muslims, who follow the orthodox way, think they got it right. Hung up on Muhammad 14 centuries ago, even though that man said at the close of every century a, a reformer would come. If he was the last man, why would there be a need to reform anything? That's right. And the last of these reformers he calls by this name, M-A-H-D-I. Right. And he, he said in his own words, and nobody argues this sanely, that that man said that when this one comes, Mahdi comes, or Mahdiya comes, he will set equity and justice in the earth. Jesus nor Muhammad did that. That's right. They're both dead. Now, what you face with, here's the big problem. The Jews don't like what Minister Farrakhan is saying because it, it's, it's signaling that they're going to lose power. Right. Listen to me carefully. This whole idea of the Jew, we are the chosen. Yes, you was. But you're not the chosen of Master Farad Muhammad. That's right. The Christians say what? You Jews blew it. 
when you rejected Jesus. Right. The Muslims say what? You Muslims, uh, you Christians and Jews blew it when you rejected Muhammad. Mm -hmm. We are saying all three groups are blowing it if they reject Master Farah Muhammad, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and Louis Farrakhan. Right. Right. That's the core of what I'm getting to. Now look, I'm not interested in no feel good. This ain't no feel good talk. I want you to think very carefully. Look, look at, the, look at what's at stake. Think on the Pope. A lot of people believe in that man. What if they came to see that the man is standing on a lie? A lot of people get messed up, huh? Black and white. We're living at the end of the world. That means the end of lies. Time to rule. That means when God's people talk about they believe in the end of, of the world, but when, it, when that time arrives, it's the time of the greatest trouble and upheaval imaginable. White folks have on the religious channel right now that there are Jews leaving Russia, leaving the North, and they say that is the fulfillment of, of, of the, uh, of the uh, writings of Isaiah and Jeremiah of the Jews that's written there coming out of the North Country coming out of the North Country. Not so. They're still trying to say the Jews got action. Dear brothers and sisters, look. When you read in here, if you mess over one of these little ones, if you never was born, you may not know, you may not even understand, you may not even believe it, but it's talking about yourself. Listen to me carefully. You don't know your value. You don't know your value. Hell, dude, you don't know your value. Because we don't treat each other right. If we knew each other's value in the eyes of God, we'd be super careful around one another. <laughs> we would be. More careful than we are. The most, why are we so precious? For one thing, God is more than sympathetic over what happened to us. He identifies with the black man and woman's pain. Yes, sir. We were allowed to be reduced to absolute zero. That's right. So that the condition that we are in is, and the place that we are in, where there's no light, or hasn't been until recently, is the spiritual and moral equivalent of what it was way back yonder, when the first life came into create into being there was nothing outside of that life and God worked with nothing to produce that which is we now are in that condition each brother or sister that you see eating pig thinking he's a nigger he ain't nothing or she's nothing that brother or sister in their brains represent that nothingness as it was in the beginning. So in Isaiah, the God says, and also in Revelation, that when he comes, he's going to create a new heavens and a new earth. What does he start from? That which is absolutely zero, that which is now the way it was in the beginning. Do you get what I'm saying? I'm trying to make it simple, but it ain't simple. It's big. God allowed us in this condition that the new heavens and the earth could start all over again. It is through our descendants way on down the road from now that eventually a new sun, new stars, even a renewal, total renewal of this planet will take place. But that's way down the road. It starts with the renewing of the minds of a people that God allowed Satan to reduce to nothing. Now what do you mean, Satan? Look, sisters and brothers, in my summary of, of this, a few points, because I something I want to say about Minister Farcom, but it's got to be put in context. It's easy to talk about the man. I done wrote a book. I bought two cases here. A book that came out some years ago. Come out again with some additions. I talk about the minister all the time because I know that how important he is. And that people gotta understand this brother because he represents 
the last chance before an awesome chastisement. I'm going to touch it in just a moment in talking about the value of this, brother. But if you don't see something of the situation, here we are now being offered a way out, not just out of slavery, suffering, and death, but offered a way out of absolute zero, a state of nothingness. We're in a situation we cannot get ourselves out of. Like a brother or sister hooked on cocaine, you need help to get up out of that. And the help has to be from someone who loves you in spite of your condition. Sister made a point earlier, I forget exactly what it was, but it made me think of this. You read in, read in your Bible where the Jesus, they say of the Jesus, Paul says of it. While we were yet in our sins, Christ died for us. It's true, but not 2,000 years ago. Nobody died for us. They wasn't thinking about us 2,000 years ago. That's right. But a man came in disguise and suffered three and a half years in this country, Master Farad Muhammad did. You need to know who he is. Yes, Eventually, every one of us got to have a thorough knowledge, or at least all that's been given, of who that man actually is. He came into this country in disguise. He got to one man who recognized him on first sight. And that's what you got right there. But that piece of information right there opens up these two books. You have prophecy in both books about the coming of God. God is coming. God is coming. Well, we are saying he has arrived. Now listen to me carefully, brothers and sisters. God, you say, well, God is a spirit. If God is nothing more than a spirit, and you know water is part spirit, because even in between molecules, if you want to call spirit nothing, in between the molecules, there's space. But you can take a glass of water. You see, your God is a spirit. I'll put your God or part of your God under a faucet and displace it by turning on the water and displace your God. It's a dumb idea. God is a spirit. Dumb today. Do you see the white man calling on a spirit God to do what he does? Look at the white man. The white man's openly stating, look, I am trying to become the supreme being. This is what he says. If I can just get my hands on Taylor's comet, that tail, I can learn how this whole creation began. Look at the white man. He is trying to gain the power to govern creation. He's not thinking like no weak punk. Here you are sitting around here, God of the Spirit, the one who told us that don't believe it. Think about it. The white man calls on himself the powers of his being. Oh, he's run a game on us. Now here's I'm gonna get to this part here. Just get right on into it. Man. I don't even know what time it is. You're going to hang with me for a few more minutes, aren't you? I just, all I've said so far is to stimulate your thinking. That's all I've been trying to do. Because it's easy just to tell this teaching. But many of us, millions of us heard it, but we don't stick. You know why? We have not made up our minds. But you know something? If you had a mother or father, anybody over you when you were small, you did something and they gave you a whooping. Now, as you were getting that whooping, or just before you got it, you was in deep fear. Right? Because here is something coming that you don't want. It's pain. You don't want that. You try to plead with that older person. Don't do this to me. Let's bargain. Let's make a deal. Isn't that what you say? You try to strike some kind of deal or bargain with this parent or older person so they will not put on you what they look like they're going to do. They look determined to lay pain on our backside. We tell them what? We will not do that again. We say it with emotion, with force. We're trying to convince them. Don't do that. I'm not going to do this again, so you ain't got to do that. <laughs> Take my word for it. Isn't that what we're saying? <laughs> now that's what we're going to be telling God in a minute if we don't get our act together. Quick. <laughs> Every one of us is going to be telling Almighty God that in a minute. 
if we don't get our act together real fast. Now here we are out in the West. They say it's the craziest part of the country. I don't know. It looked like it. <laughs> it's not the worst part of it, but in some respects it is. Chicago is the worst city on earth. Now, I, I think I should do this. I want to lay something on you. I want to stimulate this a little bit more. One more thing I want to put on your mind out of a book which, if God blesses me, if you bless me, I'm going to go to press in three weeks. It's a book called Where is the Honorable Elijah Muhammad? Is he dead or physically alive? Oh, in the meantime, though, that you buy this one, but this one just came off the press. Now, look, I want to put this on your mind one more time about this Jesus coming back thing. We're getting near the year 2000, aren't we? Yes, sir. More and more people are going to be thinking about it. It's going to be in everybody's mind, isn't it? Yes, sir. If you read, if you keep your ears open, you can hear it. Not so much among, among black folk, but white folks. Some white folks consider it a problem. Some white folks consider it a big problem. Now, if Jesus returned, no, let me go back a little bit. These are some questions that I raise in one part of the book. And then I'm going to quote what a couple of historians, scholars said in the Cosmopolitan magazine that came out in 1957 or 58. I want you to look at how white folks look at this. They don't look at this the way black folks do. We're real spooky. I mean, you go into the average church house and ask, ask us. If you come back, what you gonna see? I mean, if he came back wearing a suit like this and a bow tie, how many of us would accept Jesus? He got to come some kind of mysterious way, got to be way out, got to be something abnormal, something crazy about it for us to say that's Jesus. What would you expect? Look at this. Millions of people say he's coming. Well, what would be the signs of his arrival? How would he let us know that he has arrived? How would he let us know that he is Jesus? What would distinguish Jesus from everybody else? What would he say and do that would identify him as Jesus Christ? What language would he speak? Would he know many languages? What spot, what country would he first appear in? Why would he choose that spot, that place, that people? Suppose he first appeared in the USA. How would Jesus be received? How would the government react? Would the government officials take him for, for a friend or a foe? What about church folks and their pastors? They say they're looking forward to seeing him, so if he came in their church, how would they react? I'm Jesus, I'm here. Would they adore or distrust him? What about the press in your city? How would the press report the actual presence of Jesus? Imagine reports of the arrival of Jesus in your city, over the TV, radio, and in the newspapers. Would it be friendly or hostile? How about the editorial pages? What would we expect to see on TV and, and the newspapers of our cities? Suppose he came in some other city. You turn on the news. Jesus appeared in Cleveland. Huh? How, how, did, how did he appear? I mean, think about it. People say they believe two billion people in this modern time. They're looking for Jesus. How would the Pope of Rome react? What would he say and do? If Jesus appeared in America, would he come on over here? Would he fly over here to, 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 to bow down? What would the Pope do? Come on, what would the Pope of Rome do? With all that pomp and majesty and stuff, how would he deal with this? He said he represented. How about the UN? What kind of resolutions would they pass? Where would Jesus set up headquarters? Come on. <laughs> I mean, you say that this is not mockery? You say you, he's coming back? Well, how you gonna know that's him? What color you gonna have? Got to have a color? You say, well, color don't make no difference, child. If color make no difference, and the man, had, if he had no color, nobody saw him. Everything that exists reflects light. That shows us the color. If you came back jet black, what then? If you came back snow white, what then? Jesus, how tall is he gonna be? Like I said two, two meetings ago when I was here, two times ago, we think so childishly. We see God as a huge man sitting on a huge chair and he's old, got a long beard, that's God. How, how tall would Jesus be? With this aside, let me quote to you what some of these scholars said. 
One scholar, this came out of the 1957 Cosmopolitan magazine. If Christ walked the earth again, I'm only going to quote a little bit of it. In the event of such a return, I am sure many would recognize and follow him. There were a few such spiritually perceptive souls in Judea and Galilee. There would be many more this time. Of course, if a man were to appear claiming to be the returning Jesus Christ, he would doubtlessly be regarded as a fanatic needing psychiatric treatment and at first be disregarded by practically everyone. However, if this claimant consistently demonstrated an extraordinary goodness, compassion, humility, and love, if in addition he revealed a remarkable perception of truth together with the ability to express it in an understandable and irrefutable form, he would gradually gain respect and ultimately even a substantial acceptance of his claims. Some persons accepting the return Christ would be religious leaders and theological scholars, but more, many more would be humble men and women. They, the common people, heard him gladly in biblical times and they would do so again. But unless he used big words and unless his teachings sounded complicated, many of our contemporary super scholars would probably view him with disdain. Lots of young people would, would respond to him since youth today is spiritually enlightened to a much greater degree than formerly. Many tough, rough pagans, those looked upon as sinners, would know and accept him as the Lord. He always had the ability to convince and change real men, the kind who are what they are, good or bad. And you see, he would be now as he was then, a man's man, and a woman's man to her. Mm -hmm. This, another theologian pointed out, he would, he's, Jesus would not like the immodesty of people, especially that of women. Nor would he like the vulgarity, profanity, and the continuous display of bad manners so common today. He continued, Jesus would stand in judgment against our astonishing racism, our vulgar display of wealth, our idolatry of material things. He'd be against hypocrites. Another one said, if the historical Jesus were to return today, he would unquestionably condemn our civilization for its inhumanity, its systematic and organized lovelessness. In a word, for all the vices on account of which 2,000 years ago he condemned the civilizations of Rome and the Near East. He would also, in all probability, talk about the end of the world and the day of judgment, but in contemporary terms and in the light of recent history. Another one said, if his teachings were interpreted as involving political and nationalistic issues, he would no doubt be suppressed by the government so affected. Another one said, most of the existing governments and ruling groups, Christians and unchristian, he would appear as unpatriotic to them and a dangerous subversive. As such, he would probably be persecuted by the various governmental agencies of America. This persecution might range all the way from fines to imprisonment, banishment, and execution. White folks thinking, looking at their world as it is. These are all white folks who was interviewed. Think about this. Now, how much does this kind of talk mesh up or, 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 or correspond to what you think or what you used to think when you was a straight up Negro and you said you believed Jesus was coming back? Was your thinking as sharp as this? Am I getting through? Now, what do you expect? Now, years ago. Jesus 2,000 years ago was not recognized by the majority of the people until after he said, they say he died and went to heaven. His followers then got down and worked like hell. They worked hard. And they, the way they have told us, people came to see this individual. And from the testimony of Peter and Paul and all of James and the rest of them, correct? Why is it that there's so many of these stories in the Bible correspond for the last 60 some odd years of the activity among black people that flows from the interaction of Master Farah Muhammad and the Honorable Elijah Muhammad beginning September 1931. I'm saying to you, my dear brothers and sisters, you look at the Moses and Aaron and Pharaoh and the slaves, look at the situation we're in. It matches. Jesus, he works, he's persecuted, misunderstood, does some heavy duty things, persecuted and leaves. Peter rises up, work takes place. A lot of persecution. If you look at that situation, look at this situation, it's the same story. Are we fulfilling a script? Uh, is Minister Farrakhan and some others carefully manipulating the their own activities and the activities of others to make it correspond to what's in the Bible and Quran? Or are we in fact, collectively speaking, fulfilling what's written thousands in some cases 
many, many more thousands of years ago. What are we faced with? If this is just a big game, this is going to fade fast. It'll fade. It'll go up in smoke. But if this is something backed by God himself, and you're alive right now, and you turn this down, what are you turning down? Here's what you're turning down. You read in your Bible, 1 Corinthians 15, that at a certain point the people will be, be turned back into youth. You read that, didn't you? You read about this thing called eternal life, didn't you? You heard about the Garden of Eden, and it's seemingly promised by Jesus, is it not? You read about the kingdom of God being set up here on this earth. Did you not? Haven't you heard about that all your life? What we're saying is this is it. What's being birthed in America among black people is the birth of the kingdom of God that you've been reading about all your life in your Bible. That's what you're being invited to participate in. And that's what you turn down when you turn this down. You're not just turning down the way out of slavery and the way to, to make some more friends. You're turning down the opportunity to know God as he is and to have your own divine powers developed to their maximum. That's what you turn down when you turn this down. Isn't that something? Is that a lie or the truth? It's one way or the other. It ain't two. <clears throat> when you turn this down, you're turning down the Jesus that we've been looking for. He has appeared. Now, let's get that more clear. There is no such thing as a father, a God Father, God Son, and God Holy Ghost as we've been taught. That's false. You say, I don't believe it. That's mess messing with me. That's not messing with you. Stop and think. They came from white people. How have they ruled the world this last couple of thousand years in, since Jesus has been around? They have gone all over the earth and ruined everybody's life. Can you argue that? White people took the name of God and Jesus, went throughout the earth, and tricked everybody they found, everybody they came in contact with. They called the people living in paradise, did they not? Everybody they came in contact with, the result was those people's lives became worse. You want to argue that? There's nothing to argue. That's a fact. White people themselves have library books filled with this. So why do we trust their view of God? Why should we? What they have done is taken some truth overlaid with a lot of lies. They taught God in such a way so that you're not converted to the God of the heavens and the earth. You're converted to white people. I mean, stop and think on it now. Everybody that you know throughout the earth, all the peoples of the earth that have accepted the white man's teaching become the white man's slaves. Everybody. The white man is your real devil. Now, this is not throwing a stone. This is not getting into baby talk. Devil is not, a, it's not like saying nigger or spick or something like that or wop or guinea. It's not that. Devil is a highly scientific term. It has reference to a people who were grafted out of another people. White people were made from us a little over 6,000 years ago. The origin of their birth, though, has been a secret. The revealing of that kind of information neutralizes them. It also brings the people, black folks, up into the world. You begin to see things differently. Let me give you this example again. Look at this picture. It's like this. It's like this. Here we are down below. Here we are down below. Here's clouds. Over here is the sun. You can barely see some of its light coming through. You follow me? You ever been in an airplane? Yes, when you're on the ground, deep cloud cover is dark. You get above the cloud cover, it's another world. Right. Things look different. Here we are down here. Well, it's a matter of teaching us the truth from on high that gets in our brain that mentally enables us to see the world that we're in, but also the world that's coming. That's what this teaching does. It lifts your, the level of your thinking. It expands your awareness. Not like LSD or dope in general, but with straight up truth. It expands your spirit. 
you, it, it, it affected, like, like Sister Michelle in Chicago wrote an article, and I commented on her article. She didn't know what it was, but Minister Farrakhan's word stimulated something in her. What it was stimulating was her dormant spirit. Her spirit, her divine spirit, was asleep. And the truth affected her. The thinking on of divine truth. You're thinking the thoughts of God. The truth from God. I don't care if it goes through 50 other people. If, if it's not been messed over and you're getting it, you, and you're reacting to it, you're beginning to interact with the mind of God himself. The mind of God in your mind is rooted in the same source, the same nature. So it begins to stimulate the spirit sitting in you. So one dose of this teaching, I don't care who the brother or sister is that's running it. When you leave that, that, that meeting hall and you go out into the world, you begin to see things that you didn't see before. What is happening? What eyes have been opened? Not your physical eyes, but your, there's an eye, another eye. There's something about your brain now. I'm just using common words to get my point over. You begin to see. People look different. The world looks different. It looks different. What happened before? You was dead. Now you came up out of, you walk out the building, you go down and get in the car, you drive away. You have now just come up out of the grave of ignorance. That's what's happening. This is something it's not that you're going to pop out of, out of no tombstone, brother. It ain't going to happen like that. You sit in a chair, you hear some truth, and you wake up. It's kind of blunt, isn't it? I don't think you're going to forget it. <laughs> now, last point. All of that is to come to this. The Last Supper. The picture we're given. Jesus talking with his followers. Woman washes his feet with her hair. Peter makes a comment. He straightens Peter up. He says somebody's going to betray him. Judas and him both know what's happening. Judas leaves, and all the translations say he went out into the night to do a deed that corresponded with the darkness of the time period in which he did his thing. Then the rest of 13, all of 14 and 15 in the 16th chapter of John deals with four questions put before Jesus by four of his followers and four answers. And then they go out to the garden, the followers go to sleep, he prays, and then they arrest him. Now, that's the picture. In that situation, he's talking about another man coming. People have been so messed up behind this spirit of truth thing. I'm just going to give it to you in as blunt as I can. So at least you walk out with it. On another occasion, we can get into a deep scholarly discussion on it because we can go either way, the blunt way or the deep way. But the main thing is to make it clear. Listen now. Muslims say overseas that when Jesus was talking about the comforter, the paraclete, they have different names, it's helper. Some of the words mean helper, comforter, whatever. All these different words are involved or concepts are involved. One call alongside to help another. Jesus is talking about this man to come. Muslims say that's Muhammad ibn Abdullah. False. False. They get angry if you say that. But that wasn't the man. That wasn't him. Jesus, the man who Jesus was talking about who was coming, was right there at the table. Now come on, let's put, get your thinking cap on tight. Take about a minute or so to say it. Jesus tells Peter, I'm paraphrasing, you're going to mess up. You're going under. Satan has asked me to give you to him and the rest of you also. And I've agreed to do it. Because here we are in the process of the new heavens and the new earth. As it was in the beginning, so shall it be at the end. In the beginning, what was it? Satan said, I, I, I want to run this. Let me have him. I'll prove to you they, don't, they ain't no good. Let me have Job. God said, fine. Take him. Just don't take his life. Jesus, talking to Peter and the others. All of y'all going under. But, there's the anecdote. I have already prayed for you. I not only agreed to turn all my followers into the hands of Satan, that he may sift you as wheat. 
Satan has his purpose and I got mine. Our purposes are opposite. The act is the same, but the purpose is opposite. He wants you, he got you. But I'm going to get you back. Minus the stuff that I leave with Satan. Yeah. So when I burn Satan, I burn the stuff that used to be in you that I don't That's want. Right. Go ahead. Got it? Go ahead. Among the most important places in America right now is Los Angeles. The place that goes up and goes down. Up, down. Up, up, down, 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 down. Up, 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 down, down. Heavy duty place. Heavy black folks here. Beautiful black people. Highly educated. And the devil's, we say, uh, knowledge of things, science and whatnot, and heavy into scheming. Heavy into playing games. Both ways. Among the most streetwise black folks in America right here in Los Angeles. Which is nothing but old big old Hollywood. Same thing. <laughs> Interesting place. Heavy black people. And Minister Farrakhan was raised out here for a deep, 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 deep reason. Listen, brothers and sisters, that, that's one thing I'm going to talk about next time I come, if it pleases Allah. Why Hollywood? Why Hollywood? When you're back east and you don't know nothing about this part of the country, you, th you, stand, you tend to jump over the Midwest, jump over Albuquerque and all of that, mid and Arizona. You go straight to California. You don't think about Oregon. You don't think about Washington. It's just the West is California. And the West of the West, the Jew so-called thing you think about in the West is a place called Hollywood, out of which comes much of the white folks' entertainment. Is it not a fact? And of course, Hollywood, Jews don't like to admit it, but Jews run it. Minds, minds are influenced in a profound way, directly and indirectly out of Hollywood. So why was our brother raised there? There's a reason for that. You know, I want you to think about it in advance. That'll save us some time by the help of Allah. Allah bless us to get back and talk on that subject. I'm going to conclude what I'm saying with this. This is an area, of course, that people have problems with. But you got to understand it. Jesus, talking to his followers, the chief among the followers was Peter. He told Peter specifically, but them in general, they're going under. And it happened. He said, but I've prayed for you so that when you come fully to your senses, Peter. You must go out and strengthen the rest of your brothers. Now that's something to think about. So the book says that's what Peter did. And the first time there was this big challenge, it was Peter who stood up and defended the flock to about, about 3,000 people. What was he saying? Jesus is alive. He's not dead. The, the Holy Spirit came down on the people. Did it not? What is the relationship between Peter and this spirit coming down? In blunt language, here is what it is. Not 2,000 years ago, but almost 20 years ago, Elijah Muhammad escaped the death plot and went and ascended to the Father. How do you mean ascended? Just like that? No, no, please. This is modern time. You don't, modern or olden time, it don't happen like that. You can't flap your arms and go anywhere. It don't happen. Not like that. He escaped this death plot and was taken away. Here's a hint of it. In, the, in this next book, if it please Allah, I've interviewed some people. Where is Elijah Muhammad? One of the people I interviewed was Mr. Farrakhan's son, Joshua. I think you're going to find it, 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 it intensely interesting what he experienced that night because he was in the hospital room where Elijah Muhammad was supposedly in the bed or was in the bed. I'll leave that. I don't want to say it all now, but here's something so fascinating. That was 1975. In 1988, one of Minister Farrakhan's daughters, Donna Farrakhan, was giving birth to a child. In that, on the same floor, I, I forget, ninth floor, her sister, BJ, and her son, Anwar, had just left the room not long before. It was going toward dusk, and they were standing by this window, great big window, out of sight of Mercy Hospital, and there they saw a plane, one of them round ones, 
with the lights underneath it mm. passing right by. It blew them away. Mm. I interviewed them also. If you, if they were here now, and you saw them like I've interviewed them, you would, con you are convinced that either they are telling a tremendous lie, or a tremendous hallucination took place, or they saw what they say they saw. Earlier this year, two sisters in Phoenix, Arizona. I have them on audio tape. I don't have it on a on a video tape. I interviewed them. So one of these same planes, they're out now. They're not exactly in a farming area, but where they live, there's not a lot of houses. They saw a sister was coming home from dropping her daughter off, and she was walking up with the, fumbling with the keys. Happened to look up, and she said, "Oh my God! I get you the tape so you can hear it. You listen to this. It's powerful." She fumbled with the key. She got inside. She woke the other sister up who was in her room. Folks are seeing these little planes. Well, BJ and Anwar saw this plane outside of that window at the Mercy Hospital. He said, he said, Jabril, it was so close. It looked like I could have reached out and touched it. Interesting. Now, why do I mention it? Just, just to touch the idea that when Joshua, I interviewed him. The amazing thing is that it was like something locked up in his mind. He had an experience, and it just stayed there. Haven't you ever had? Some people have had those tr tr heavy experiences, and it just stays in your mind. It takes time and circumstance to bring it out. In 1991, right after Minister Farrakhan gave his speech, "Who is God?" We drove in the car back to his home, and as we we take our shoes off in his house, and as we were sitting taking the shoes off, it began to come out of Joshua, he began to realize the heavy experience he had as a teenager back there now almost 20, about 20 years ago, it'd be 20 years in a few months. And he began telling us, and I'm telling you, it was fascinating. What was even more fascinating to me was that was 1991. I interviewed him the early part of this year, 94. And, to, and I sat there watching him and I was amazed inwardly as I watched him say to me practically verbatim what he said back then in 91. It's in this book. What am I getting at? The Jesus you thought died and ascended, that only happened 20 some years ago. That's heavy for black folks to take. But that's part of what you got to get into to get fully resurrected. Now, he escaped the death plot and went with Master Farah Muhammad. Where is he, Jabril? He's on the mother plane. 24 7? I don't know about no 24 7. But I know that's where he first went after after a stop off place. Whether he's there every single day, I, I, how do I know? I haven't seen him in, in 20 years. But I know that's where he spent a considerable amount of his time. Now there's a lot to that. You again read about this man's vision. In the fourth chapter of Revelation, didn't you read where 24 bow? He's given a vision in heaven. And the 24 and others all bow to this one who takes the throne and takes power. The man described there or the being described in your Bible is God. How can God take power? What do you mean? He just gets the power at a certain time? This kind of talk there, brothers and sisters, gets us into the inner sanctum of that which, which has been kept as, as a secret from us. You read in your Bible where Jesus was thankful that the secrets were kept from, from, uh, from the wise and the prudent. The problem is you think it happened 2,000 years ago. It didn't happen back then. There's nothing you can read of in this Bible, in the teachings of Jesus, that was the secret. But the secret is sitting in the words. You read it, but they don't make any sense. You see, I understand it. Yet there's some questions here that don't that never have been answered, and I'm raising one of them right now. Revelation 4, the man has a vision. It takes him into heaven. And there he's in on a heavy scene. He sees this being take power over creation. Then the very next chapter, here comes a man under the symbol of a lamb. And he enters into this heavenly situation. He comes in in bad shape. A lamb as if he had been slain. If you think it's Jesus 2,000 years ago, okay, he got holes in him and head got messed up, right? If Jesus went to heaven like that, he's somebody who looks like he had been killed, right? Matted blood and cut up and stuff, holes in his hands and feet. If that Jesus went into heaven, he went in there, been bad shape and had to be worked on, right? 
Are you following this? This is what you say you believe in. I'm just saying, bring it from then and bring it down in front. There was no lost sheep back there. That's us. No lost coin, lost coin back there. That's us. No dry bones back there. That's us. If you see yourself, then you can see Jesus. So when G Jesus is talking to his followers and he's talking about Peter's future assignment, Peter already recognized him up to a certain point. Jesus told Peter, upon this rock, this man, I'm going to build my church. All I'm saying to you is, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said this at last suppers. And one man he told was going to go down and come up, he said that to Minister Farrakhan. And the man is up. Now don't you see, he obviously is an extraordinary brother. What kind of weight do you think is on that man's back? You don't have the weight of 40 million people on you, do you? Just stick with me for a few more minutes till I get to the end of this. He tells this brother, you will sit in my seat as the father. Obviously, Elijah Muhammad, even if you don't know too much about him, obviously was a mighty strong and unusual black man. Right. He withstood the forces of the government and everything they tried. Over 2,500 dirty tricks, according to the church commission reports. Everything they tried on and did to stabilize foreign governments with, they tried on the nation of Islam, but as long as Elijah Muhammad was here, they couldn't do nothing with us. His son, someone from inside the house, took this whole thing under. And Minister Farrakhan and others were put in the hands of Satan. Okay, now the brother's up. This march alone, if you just sit down and read his words, one of the things you should be able to see is consummate wisdom. Look how he deals with those white folks who say, we well, didn't mess over you people. Look how he deals with them in that article. That if you're not willing to participate in solving the problem or seeking the solution to the problem, then you're saying that you're just like your fathers. He has wisely dealing with this situation. Obviously, Minister Farrakhan is, is the heaviest brother we're ever going to meet, or he's being guided by God. We are saying that he's guided by someone else, the Jesus Christ that you read about. My wife, my when you're reading your New Testament, you're reading current events. You're walking through the book of Acts right now and about to walk out of the book of Acts. What ends the book of Acts? Judgment. Jesus comes back and <laughs> big things happen. You're not so far from that. I'm telling you as plain as I know how to tell you, you're right face to face with the return of the Jesus you thought was here 2,000 years ago. He just left 20 years ago. <laughs> Minister Farrakhan is a Jesus too, and so are you. Am I throwing around, around words and dealing with double speak? Uh-uh, uh-uh, no, 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 no. If you read Paul's words, Paul worked to become one with Jesus, Christ-like. He worked to get the followers like himself. He said, follow me. To become one with Jesus is to become what? One with God or become godly. It's not hard to understand this. The thing is, how much of the white folk stuff do you want to get rid of? How much of this world do you still love? Because this kind of talk sets up a problem inside of every one of us. And this is not as far as we could go. Listen to some of the ministers. Listen to the speech he made. You got to get this tape. He spoke in a church right after the Southern Regional speech. I don't have the exact date, but I'll get you the tape. He spoke in a church and dealt straight up with Christmas and straight up with the moral condition of the parishioners and the people who go to church and those of us who don't go to church and dealt with our condition in relation to the one we say we expect to come in a few years. We got work to do. The area that we're in right now, this whole West Coast, is going to be chastised severely one day. 
if you who know the truth don't re-triple your efforts to gain your people that they may avert the crushing disaster coming then their blood shall be required at our hands to know the truth and not to tell your people is to cooperate with the devil himself I ask some of you every night every time I got a chance to come in this city how many black folks live here a lot of you don't know the more you love your people the more you want to know all about them you hear what I'm saying now the conclusion of this is this afternoon is this part of understanding the honorable Louis Farquhar is to understand his Peter and Paul like position to the Jesus in your Bible that's a word picture that's being lived out right now and when you read about the Holy Spirit it's the spirit that's coming down that began to come on black folks again with the rise of Minister Farrakhan. In a certain sense, he's the Holy Spirit, but in another sense, it is the spirit of a man projecting energy to a people. Muslims are having visions all over this country. Hmm? Some Muslims are having, you're having all kinds of experience. Some of y'all, you you've been on the plane and whatnot, right? Not, not in this city? You'd be the only city in the country. You read where your young man and all that stuff about having dreams and vision, that's going on now all over this country. What I'm getting at is the power that's sitting in you, that's dormant, is coming alive. Now, brothers and sisters, in my conclusion, that to the extent that you sincerely accept this teaching, God is a man. God has always been a man. So is Satan. You are absolutely God's children. What do you mean by God's children? Originally, when the first God created the heavens and the earth, or rather probably prior to, to the creation of the heavens and the earth, he produced the woman and through her produced us. We are all direct descendants of the first life that came into being. I say it again. We were taught by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad in this country that every one of us, through our parents and parents, parents, and parents, parents, we share the same nature as that God that we originally were from. Now you get what I'm saying? I'll say it again. You were born of a mother and father who was born of a mother and father, but if you go back far enough, yes, into the billions and trillions and trillions of years, you're going to wind up with one black man and one black woman. And their nature is our nature. And our nature is their nature. They're not here now. What does that make you? If that's true, that means that by nature, you're God. Not necessarily the supreme of the gods, but God and have in you powers that you don't know nothing about yet. And you too, sister. It means that you got powers that you're sleeping on. You read about it and hear about it and all this talk about people traveling in space. Some of y'all already do that. We got some people that actually space travel, but not in no spooky fashion. There's powers that you got in your brain. The white folks call this the last frontier. You want to know where your God power is? It's in your brain. Cut off both arms and feet and take out one lung and take out one kidney. You're still here. Right? Your power is in your brain. And white folks can't go but so far in there. So this brother who I began mentioning, here he read what those white folks said and he rejected it. He said it was driving him crazy and that's what continuously eating from the white man's lies will do. It'll drive you crazy. It will do that. I hope that you've gotten what I've tried to do. And all I've tried to do is stimulate your thinking. Think deeper. Because just to, just to go over this message time and again, you can see that only a certain amount of people want to accept it. We're so much in love with this world that the scientists didn't see but a small number of us getting out of this. They only saw 144,000. This is how I'm ending this talk. On the back of this book, I pull out an excerpt. If a person just picks up the book and reads the back, I hope that will be enough to cause them to want to look on the inside. At one point I said this, only 144,000 were prophesied to escape the doom of this world by some of the wise scientists. One slim, and I put slim in quotes, is slim from the vantage point of those that don't know and 
not slim to God. Last chance, a way out was outlined in the scriptures, however, to save the millions of our people, even to providing others of this world a way out. It's there in the scriptures. It involved the production of Minister Farrakhan by the Lord of the Worlds and special preparation and by the prayers of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad for him before his departure in 1975. All of this and more ultimately depended upon the exquisite execution of the divine plan by Master Farah Muhammad, which is recorded in the scriptures. He brought the Honorable Elijah Muhammad into the understanding and into the power of working with him to bring aspects of him into reality. The position Minister Farrakhan is growing into in this world's life reflects the position of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad in the quote-unquote heavens. You see the rise of Minister Farrakhan? This man is to rise, his teacher said, to the pinnacle of success and honor. God wants people in this country to look up to our brother. And looking up to him, they're looking up to a man who in a certain sense reflects even higher wisdom. Furthermore, it is only from the exalted position, the pinnacle of this world's life, that Minister Farrakhan can meet with and receive from the Honorable Elijah Muhammad the new teachings that will eventually bring our nation to infinitely higher grades. He must go up and be up to meet again with his teacher. So, if you have a Holy Quran, or if you, even if you don't have it, include in your thinking, if you reflect on these words that I've tried to, or that I've conveyed to you this afternoon, Reflect on Surah 57, verse 20. Know that this world's life is only sport and play and gaiety and boasting among yourselves and vying in the multiplication of wealth in children. It is as rain, whose causing the vegetation to grow pleases the husbandman, then it withers away, so, so that you see it turning yellow and then it becomes chafed. And in the hereafter is a severe chastisement, also forgiveness from Allah and his pleasure. This world's life is nothing but a source of vanity. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad said of Master Farah Muhammad that he is merciful. His mercy encompasses all things, that he has given the white race time over time. He wants to be known. And because the way he makes himself known is through Elijah Muhammad. And the chief instrument used by God and the Honorable Elijah Muhammad to get people to see what's really going on is your brother. The Honorable Louis Farrakhan. One man is sufficient. He's a magnificent display of the wise wisdom of the God. Yes, sir. My brothers and sisters, as you heard the minister say, he said to your faces, straight up, in the general terms, that you were, in words, heavier than himself. Did he not say that? His service is to bring out of us, get us on the road, on this side of Calvary. Now remember, the nation fell before, but not ever going to fall again. It arose on that man's faith in the unseen. Not that it cannot be seen, but he trusted the word of his teacher. That's, the, that's how the, this all got up. All of the magnificent things that are going on and will happen came from a man's faith, his confidence and trust in the word of another man. That's something to think about. So I hope that you have thought on this before as we've been lied to. The white race is not our friends. They've misled us. Now they're in trouble right along with us. But the difference is we're in great trouble if we turn this down. They're in great trouble because we're in their midst. They have their opportunity to get out of this situation. We have ours. But now, think beyond that. Think beyond the kind of world you would like to help to build. We're not just talking about a club or an organization or something. It's not like that at all. It even goes beyond the word nation. We're talking about a brand new world. I just want you to come face to face with the position that you're in. You're in the position that you thought the early Christians were in. Face to face with Jesus is just leaving and about to come back to set up the kingdom of heaven on earth. You, you and I got that chance now. And you can't change it unless you just drop dead. If you die today, then of course you won't be a part of the kingdom. A great memory, but that's about all. I hope that you think about it. If you don't think about it too much now, it'll pop up in your brain. Some of these words are going to come back. That's right. 
to you sooner or later. I thank you so much for your kind attention. And I hope that by the help of Allah, when I'm blessed to come back, if Allah blesses me, I want to include, sisters, that part of this talk about Jesus that includes you directly. And while Hollywood has all of us involved, the way women are used in Hollywood is utterly disgraceful, isn't it? Disgraceful. Take beautiful women, strip them off, throw them in the public's face. Great big billboards that the brothers pick me up. Some huge billboard. Women almost naked as a jaybird, as they say. What's that about? What is that for? On the one hand, women don't want to be looked upon as, to use the old common expression, a piece of meat. Do you, sisters? You want brothers or men to look at you deeper than that. The eye can only see but so much. It just sees the external. And, and even a part of that it doesn't see. I see in front of my brother. I don't see what's, on, what's behind my brother, do I? But there's another eye that we got to learn to cultivate. And that's called spiritual development. What is that? That's where the power is. That's where your real power is. And when that's developed, we're gone. I thank you so much for your attention. May I ask how many are here today for your first time? May I see your hands? Two sisters. Good. You're so well integrated into the others, I can't tell new from old. And I don't mean old, old. I mean, you've been here for a few more times. How many of you are here today, for, who are here today for your first time, believe that what you've heard is true? You do. I think it's true. All praise be to Allah. For those of you who believe that what you've heard today is true and good for black people, don't worry about white folks. Let them take care of themselves. Don't be the white man's lawyer. You and I need a lawyer ourselves. If you believe that what you heard is the truth, how many of you would like to accept this and join your hands with Minister Farrakhan's hands and help lift your people? If so, let me see your hands. And all you brothers and sisters, I would like you to come down front and allow me the privilege of shaking your hands. Minister Farrakhan is not here to shake your hands. I'll shake your hands for him. And you follow the secretary to the back. Please come forward. This is that great getting up morning. The black man and black woman is standing up taking a stand with God.